Hey there and welcome back to my channel, Blue Nose Trading. My name is Tori Solis and today I'm going to be sharing my personal first impressions and experience with a new clay body, Dragon Fruit by Industrial Minerals Company. This is a cone 6 body that fires white with black specks. It's made by Industrial Minerals Company out of Sacramento, California. The shrinkage for this clay is about 13% and the absorption when I tested it was under 0.1% at my hot cone 6. When I came across this clay, its beauty immediately blew me away and I had to find out how to get some. As it turns out, Industrial Mineral Companies was able to ship me a 50 pound flat rate box to Texas. I love clay bodies that create their own visual or textural interest for exposed partially raw body work. I like to leave parts of my pots unglazed to demonstrate the beauty of the raw clay as part of my design in many cases. For me, throwing this clay was a bit more challenging than other bodies that I've worked with in the past. This clay is very dense. It's a lot like porcelain with sand in it, but you get the worst parts of both of those worlds. It's sensitive and dense, prone to sagging and flopping over if you overwork it, and it gets overworked pretty quickly, much like porcelain. It's gritty and can rub the side of your palm against the wheel as many gritty clays are prone to do. The grains are pretty coarse and you can see the black specks of this clay in the raw clay body. Because it took me a while to get around to this project, my clay was a little hard starting out, which is nobody's fault but my own. This made it more difficult to center, especially on my wheel. When I have to apply a lot, apply a lot of pressure, the wheel creates sort of a wobble it's this Aspire. It doesn't feel capable of handling the amount of force I'm putting onto it. I don't know if I told you guys yet, but I ordered a new wheel. It's a big kid wheel, but it's on back order. That will be an entire episode, so be sure to subscribe to my channel if you want to find out what kind of wheel I ordered and see the unboxing and review and all that fun stuff for that. I found it personally challenging to get the same height with this clay that I can achieve with different clay bodies. It just felt so resistant to going up and had such an insistence on slumping down. Super frustrating for me. In this series, I'm going to make my usual gambit of forms, so some mugs, cups, and planters. I plan to do some carving and make some bonsai pots. More or less, I'm going to apply my style of work to this body of clay. Finishing pieces takes a bit extra care on the wheel with this body. If you're finishing the outside with a rib, you can sometimes wipe back a lot of the fine white clay and leave a grittier surface with heavier black flecks on it. I also found that in compressing my bottoms, I made the bottoms of most of my cups extra speckly. This isn't really like a good or a bad thing, it's just something to be aware of consciously as you go on to make your own design choices if you're working with this clay. Trimming is very much like trimming porcelain. At Leather Hard, it's very thick, dense body. If you try to dig too deep, you can catch the pot on the wheel and pull it off or distort it or give it a crack. It likes to crack. The best approach I've found is to have a very sharp tool and to take the trimming in tidy and delicate ribbons. This clay stiffens quickly, but it also dries fairly slowly. The clay loses plasticity as quickly quickly as it dries and becomes much more likely to crack when it has stiffened even slightly. Despite stiffening rather quickly, this body is very dense and can take a little longer than some of my other clays to dry completely. Pulling handles for these was pretty straightforward. Pepita was all up in my business while I was doing that, but that's fine as long as she doesn't get into danger or trouble. I'm pretty unfazed by her adorable shenanigans at this point in my life. I mean, she's still adorable, but things gotta get done. Bird's cute or not. And I'm still no expert on pulling handles, but I'm at a point where I'm finding my handle, so to speak. I've noticed I lean towards a consistent shape and placement. I like a handle that looks like a smooth base clef with a top slightly lower than the rim of the cup. That makes them ideal for storing upside down in a cabinet and for the functional use of pour over coffee makers. I alter how many fingers fit in the handle by how far the handle swoops out off the mug. I find that I like to keep a variety of sizes as the opinion on how to hold a mug is such a personal choice. I also find that the variety of handle sizes helps to add the personal add to the personal experience of choosing the perfect mug. This clay is sensitive to cracking. If you apply too much pressure to the bottom or any side, so it's important that you are trimming, applying stamps, attaching handles, or any manner of attachments, or punching holes for planters, 
Go slow and don't apply too much force to warp or distort the, s the side as much as you can. Like avoid warping or distorting the sides. It does not like that. Even if it looks fine, it might crack in the bisque or in the glaze. It's very sensitive, so don't just be gentle with it. When carving, the sharper the tool you have, the better, which is obviously true in pretty much every case, but it's almost a necessity with this clay body. If your tools aren't sharp, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to get a substantial amount of resistance and drag while you're carving, which leads to a rough carved surface that will need additional refinement. Even my tool wasn't really sharp enough, so I had to wipe over my carving with a wet paintbrush or a damp sponge so that I could soften the edges. I want to make these cups feel great to hold and to touch, not ones that could cut up your fingers. Many of these carving designs are some of my old favorites. I really like simple line designs that offer a chance for strength and contrast, especially when it comes to glazing later. I like strong vertical lines of glaze and laid beside the raw clay body. I like to create a cratered or slippy surface textures that allow the glaze to move and break. I like the combination of textures to create enjoyable tactile sensory experiences when using the cup in its most functional sense. If you have a glaze that might run, it will run on this clay. If you have a glaze that's more or less stable, test it because it might still run on this clay body. If you're too lazy to test your glazes, then use some kiln cookies or keep an angle grinder handy because these glazes are probably going to run. They run a lot. Now because I enjoy bodywork anyway, for a lot of the glazes I thought were suspect to running, I only glazed the top half of the piece. Even still, I really messed up a kiln shelf from all the dripping and running that I got when I fired this series. But that's all fine because now I get to make a video on using an angle grinder to repair the kiln shelf, which is great. But you know, if you'd rather not ever have to watch that video, try to receive my warning here and take extra caution to do some testing before before you glaze. If you want to see how this series turns out, be sure to subscribe to my channel, Blue Nose Trading. The series review for Dragon Fruit Project is coming out this Sunday at 10 a.m. Central Time. If you'd like to help support my channel and get early access to all my videos and ceramics, consider becoming a patron of my work at patreon.com slash bluenosetrading. Thank you for being here. Remember that you have some really great ideas. Drink lots of water and hug all of your friends pretty often. I will see you guys next week.